All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, I just want to start by saying how excited we are for homecoming this week, especially honoring uh, Terry Gainley uh, for all that she's done for our university, 40-year career, uh, just a Hall of Fame career, and really excited about her being the Grand Marshal of our homecoming parade. Um, just a huge fan of her and what she's been able to accomplish at the University of Minnesota with a historic career, and um, very, very excited to honor Terry. So with that said, we'll open up for questions. Coach, you uh, talked about uh, the fans after the Ohio State game. You talked about them out in Colorado, how well they traveled. Uh, does it kind of remind you what the potential might be here of the, of the fan base for uh, Gopher football? Yeah, I mean, the one thing I'll say about our fan base is, I mean, the fan base has been here before me. Uh, they're here now. They'll be here after me. Um, we have incredible fans who love the Gophers, and I think that – uh, is exciting for any head coach and any staff and any player that comes to play, especially at a very historical institution with so much tradition like the University of Minnesota. Um, just so proud of the, the way they travel, uh, the loyalty they continue to show. Uh, it's so positive for our players to see. Um, you know, there's so much stuff out there, uh, you know, in the, in the real world and outside of our walls. Um, you know, that may be not so positive at times, right? And, uh, but to see our fan base and to see them travel all the way to Colorado, to see them show up at Ohio State, Miami, Ohio, uh, that's what this place is capable of doing. And um, it was capable of doing it before, capable of doing it la later on in, in the future. We have an incredible fan base. And uh, I'm just so proud that they continue to show their support for our team. And we could always use it and use more of it. And uh, very, very thankful for them, though. Can you talk briefly about NIL? I know that's not your thing to do, but what do you sense or what do you, what do you get uh, out of the community as to maybe what might be going on, what the potential of that is? Well, I think change is inevitable, and I think this is a whole off-season topic about NIL and, and how it's you know, going to change the landscape of college football, and uh, especially in the recruiting department, not only recruiting, just how you handle your football team. And you know, we're not allowed to have direct contact and, and making arrangements of the actual deals. You can make introductions, but you can't necessarily do anything with the deals uh, and, uh, and, and setting all those pieces up. But I think when you look at where we are, I think there's, it's a very transformational time in college football, uh, whether it's realignment, whether it's NIL. Uh, there's a lot of things, transfer portal, there's a lot of new things that are kind of making college football different than what it's been. But being in a city with three and a half million people and being in the state that we are and being in a metro area with 18 Fortune 500 companies and all types of companies besides that, I think there's great potential here uh, for what we can become. And I think, you know, change is inevitable. And what was doesn't always have to be what's going to be. Uh, we just have to be incredibly creative. Uh, we have to be able to use it like everyone else uh, to be able to use it part of uh, recruiting, recruiting student athletes to come here. Again, not setting those things up, but when you look at where you are and where you're located and what resources we have around here, this can be game changing for the University of Minnesota. They can be game changing for where we're going into the future. Um, so again, whether people like it or don't like it, it is here and it's the future of college football and it's not going away. Um, and we have to be able to adapt to those things and make them for the student athlete. You know, all these changes that we've made over the last however many years, whether it's the safety, the health and safety issues, whether it's um, the NIL, whether it's a transfer portal. Remember, it's all about the student athlete. It's all about the student athlete's well-being and safety, and it's all about the student athlete experience. And we have a very, very unique uh, location of where we are, um, and we need to be able to use that, and we need our community to, to want to use that and use our student athletes and, uh, and really take this program to a different level. And I think that's, we're, we're capable, very, very, very capable of doing that. DJ, when you look at anytime you have a long run, it seems like Coke Keith is knocking someone to the ground. How would you describe his impact on your offense? Uh, I mean, he's one of the toughest young people I've ever met mentally, physically, emotionally, um, you know, and he's, he's developed, you know, he hasn't always been like that. Uh, he's been, he's been tough. Uh, but when you talk about somebody who loves the weight room, I mean, he wants to be a strength coach one day. And he just loves the weight room and loves to improve, loves the science behind the body um, and the kinesiology and, and the study of how the body grows. And I mean, he's just he's very smart. He's very intelligent, very tough, loves his teammates. Is just an incredible football player, knows his role. Um, not ever sitting there saying, I don't like my role, I need to do this, I need to be catching 10 passes a game, knows his role, knows what he's really good at, and does it at an extreme, uh, an extreme level. 
Um, but he is really the attitude of this team, and that's what you want to be able to have. Line up, put the ball down, and let's go. And Coquif is uh, somebody who directly reflects that. How much has Thomas Rush improved over the past year? I think he's gotten a lot better. Remember, I mean, last year was really the first time we kind of moved him over. He didn't really have an offseason to play the R position. I think he's gotten better because he knows the position more. I think the competition with him and Boye and both of them on the field at the same time, sometimes not, I think has really helped them both get better. Uh, I mean, he's a student of the game. You talk about a person who loves football. Uh, he loves football. I mean, he was a running back in high school. I mean, he's an incredible athlete playing a position that, you know, again, he's, you want to count it one year maybe playing. I think he's excelling really well. And the more he plays it, the better he's going to be. Um, comes from an unbelievable family. And, uh, you know, when your hardest players are your – or your hardest workers are your best players, we've always said that, you have something really special, and Thomas Rush fits in that category. How impressive was Wally on Saturday? I think it was very impressive. I, I think, you know, I think I I said at the end, I told all of you that there's so much more meat left on the bone uh, of what we could be able to do. And I think part of that is just we're playing some youthful players who are very talented. Uh, they're just they're just scratching the surface of how good they're going to be. I think Justin Wally is that. Um, you know, he was tested on a deep ball, made a really good play, made some nice tackles. Uh, he's tough. Um, you know, and playing as a true freshman is very difficult. It is. No matter what level it is, no matter where you're at, uh, it's very difficult to do, but he stepped into that role. I think Paul Haynes has done a great job of coaching and developing him in all areas. And it's not just the football part as a true freshman. you got the academic part. you got the social part. The spiritual part's different. Your day-to-day -day schedules are different. There's a lot of adaptation that has to happen for a true freshman to play. And I think Justin Wally is, has hit it head on and done a really good job uh, of making himself better, but also making the other people around him better. I mean, if it, you, you talked about leaders, and if people were voted on the, the freshman class of who's one of the best leaders in that, in that class, I mean, Justin would be right at the top of that list. You guys have gotten healthy at the wide receiver position. What would you say kind of are the main bullet points of, of what you'd like to see in the development of the passing game? Uh, we're going to take what the defense gives us. You know, I mean, if we have to throw the ball 11 times a game, we'll throw the ball 11 times a game. We have to throw it 35 times, we'll throw it 35 times. Um, you know, we want to be as balanced as possible. And I think, you know, some people think balanced is all about it's 50-50. It's doing what you have to do to win the football game, right? And as long as we continue to develop in all areas that way, then we're doing what's necessary uh, with our offense, defense, and special teams. Um, but, you know, so, there, there was two or three throws that I think could, we could have been better at. I mean, that game, in my opinion, could have been 14 of 17. You know, we were 11 of 17, you know, and so there were three throws or, 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 a, or a drop that, um, you know, has to be way better. Uh, but, again, we're going to take what the defense gives us, and we need to be really efficient when we do throw the football. But, again, part of that 50-50 or that, that balance isn't necessarily 50-50. It's doing what it takes to win the football game. And, um, we're doing what it took to win that football game against Colorado, and that was, uh, you know, that was our, our mission. We came out of there one and zero, and and uh, we'll always get better at every every single thing we do. Whether it's pass game, run game, I mean, pass defense, rush defense, pressure on the quarterback. We're always working on getting better at all of it. So whatever it takes to be able to present itself to win the football game, we'll be able to do. When you watch the game back, what stood out to you about Bucky and Kai? You know, I mean, Kai getting some of his first action he's ever been in, you know. Um, sometimes your mind gets a little ahead of your body, you know. And, uh, you know, but it was really good for him to get in there and get some carries and then also obviously score a touchdown, uh, which is a credit to our offensive line and everybody else around him. And then I think for Bucky, the chance to be able to get out there and go play some meaning, meaning, uh, you know, meaningful football. You know, he's a very talented individual. I think everybody knows that in this room. I don't think it's very hard to figure out that he's, he's very gifted. But just because you're gifted doesn't make you a great football player just yet, but he is a really good football player. And the more he plays, the better he's going to be. He's a great teammate. He's, he's a, he's a, he studies the game nonstop. I think Muhammad Ibrahim has done a great job, along with Trey Potts, of, of bringing that, that youth of that room um, you know, up uh, to you know, the, the standard of what we expect out of our tailbacks, no matter who it is, uh, you know, whether it's uh, Cam or Kai or Bry uh, uh, Bryce or, or Bucky or Trey. Again, it, it's going to fall back, and I said this before, it's going to fall back on the offensive line and the tight ends. I mean, you know, we, a lot of people get the credit with the ball in their hand, but when you look at it, I mean, the guys up front are doing a lot of the work. 
Uh, there's a lot of broken tackles, yes, but that's part of being a team. Everybody has to improve their game. You know, when the best player I think in the conference goes out, everybody has to be able to take piece of that burden upon themselves, no matter if you play it or not, whether you're a freshman or a senior, and excel your learning and your development and your responsibility to the team. And that's what makes a team a, a team. Stark and was, was that the best your offensive line has played this year? Um, you know, I would say that at times uh, it was. Uh, I think at times it wasn't. You know, I think it's very difficult, you know, when you kind of watch it from that perspective. But when you go into the film room, I mean, you know, you're talking about five, six guys at one point doing everything fundamentally sound, detailed, the exact same way, or the exact way you want it with twists and movements and hat position and hat placement and pad level and first step. And there's so many things that go involved in that uh, finish. So. Uh, I would say that there were times it was, and then there were times it wasn't, which, again, I mean, that's, that's why we're coaches. We're going to find the things that, you know, we're not so good at and make them better and highlight the things that are the standard and, and, and raise the bar. What have you seen from Bowling Green so far this year? You know, I, I've, I've, I've watched them late last night and then, um, you know, this morning. Um, you know, I think uh, when you kind of look at them, they've got a lot of transfers that have come in. Uh, you know, some guys uh, came over from, you know, from Kansas and, some guys came over from Washington, and they got a lot of really good, uh, really good skill. And I think they spread people out. Uh, they do a lot of different things with screens to get the ball in their hands of individuals to go make a play with it. They'll throw the ball down the field. A lot of different personnel groupings, a lot of different formations. Uh, spread you out, get the ball out of their hand as fast as possible. Uh, young up front, uh, but they they play their tail off. And then defensively, I mean, they're a little bit of a three three stack. Uh, so, again, they've got uh, some challenges they present that way, um, which we haven't faced this year. So we've got uh, work cut out for us that way, and they fly around and, and, and get around the ball. So um, they've been in a lot of close games, and, you know, we just got to be able to play our best football. The focus has to be 1-0 and in the Bowling Green season and, and um, you know, do what we have to be able to do to win that football game, which we'll know more as we continue to, you know, game plan throughout the week. But uh, we have to be at our best, that's for sure. Paige, we've seen uh, Ottman Bell throughout his career be really good at those 50-50 balls down the down the field. Yeah. Having played that position, what are the maybe the key kit characteristics for a guy to be good in those situations? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, it, it starts with the release. You've got to do a really good job of releasing a DB, especially in the press coverage that we're facing. Then there's the transition of the route vertically. Uh, we're either going to win the hip or not, right? And then the ball placement's really big on that. But I think the, 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 I think what Chris does really well, and when I talk to NFL scouts, I talk about this too. He, he's, very, he, he's a violent receiver, and I'm meaning violent in terms of, yeah, he's a great run blocker. He's a violent pass catcher. But the, the ability to go from the ground vertically, everybody tests a vertical jump. But what we like to look at is how fast he goes from the ground vertically. And Chris has a, a unique ability to get vertically, uh, vertical very quickly. Uh, and that gives him the advantage to be able to go get the ball and be able to jump maybe later than a DB can jump. Um, but he's got incredible core strength, great center of gravity. He's got great balance. Uh, but the ability to grow, jump from the ground vertically in a split second, uh, I think he's very, very good at that. And, you know, he understands body position, ball placement, knows how to manipulate his body according to where the ball's going to be. Uh, and then he finishes well. And he's strong. People don't think he's not that big of a guy when you're sitting. He's not a 6'4", 220-pound guy. But he plays violent. He plays strong. Um, you talk about a kid that loves football. And it's just good to have him back in the rotation. How much does John Michael Schmitz make everything tick for your offensive line? I mean, he's, he's a special football player. I mean, he can, he, he, he's very athletic. He's very tough. Um, he's very smart, very intelligent. Uh, it's kind of like a catcher in baseball. He calls a tremendous game, right? Um, and he, you know, he, he makes it all go for us. You know, he gets everybody you know, in the right position to start the play. And then he's got incredible how, toughness, uh, finish. He cares. I mean, you talk about somebody who cares. I mean, this is a south side of Chicago tough kid. Um, who's got just incredible parents uh, who love and support them, and they were at the game in Colorado, and just so many people that, uh, you know, that care. I think caring is half the battle. If you truly care, you're going to be pretty good, you know, and then the level of how good you are goes from how much work you put in, and, and nobody works harder. But he is, I mean, he, like I said, Coach keeps that mentality of our team, John Michael Schmitz, that mentality of our team, and you have to have those guys. Um, and, you know, they're passing on legacy and, and to generation to generation, like they learn from people before them of what it means to be a gopher and, and what it means to be on the offensive side of the ball. So one or two more. Can you explain the end of the first half, what happened there? Like Colorado has the option to start the clock. I don't know, just 
for yeah, I'm going based on what I what I was told. Simple as that. And so I had a timeout. I mean, if I wasn't told that the the clock would have, you know, continued to go. I mean, I wasn't told that I would have called the timeout. I mean, I would have just got up and we would have ran, hurry up, ran the ball, called timeout, kicked the field goal. Going based on what I said, and that's still why I even didn't call the timeout because I was I thought that was a mistake. But um, you know, I've got to double and triple check that. Simple as that. You know, and uh, officials do a really good job usually communicating with me over and over and over and over about those situations. And, um, you know, again, it falls on me. Um, you know, uh, you know I, I should have doubled and triple checked. I kind of took that for granted a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, I told the players that was my fault. Uh, but, again, I mean, that was discussed. It was just, uh, you know, thought I heard something else. Have one more or is everyone all set? PJ, as somebody who appreciates connect- connectivity in your program, what do you do during homecoming week specifically to, you know, with maybe former players, alumni, to connect them to the team this week before the game? Well, I, I think, first of all, you know, this, I've always compared homecoming to like when you kind of think of a high school homecoming, right? I mean, you got the dance, you got the parade, you got, you know, all these, you know, got the, the, mm-hmm. the, you know, the decorating of the gym, you got all that stuff going on, you know? The football player's job is to make sure that you go out there and give an experience and for everybody on game day that everybody leaves with the one and no type taste in their mouth. And that, that's your responsibility. You know, leave it up to somebody else to go decorate the gym and, and pick out what punch we're going to drink and, you know, whatever it is. I mean, you know, for us, our, our job is to go out there and put a great product on the field. And so for us, a lot of the routine things won't change. Uh, we bring a lot of former players in, a lot to speak to our team, a captain's breakfast prior to the game. Um, you know, there'll be a lot of things around campus, but again, our, our role in this whole thing is, is to go create a really elite experience. And then after the game, connect, connect with a lot of the alumni. And I always like that after the game, you know, is being able to have, uh, the ability to be around the alumni and former players and get them around the locker room and get around the field and things like that. But leading up to that, I mean, that's, that's for, uh, that's for everybody else to really enjoy and the alumni to enjoy the alumni and everything else. And then after the game's done, that's, that's kind of my belief in homecoming and, and what it has been is, is making sure and that, that our players want to come back, uh, you know, when they're done playing to come support, uh, you know, uh, the Gophers when they return back. Um, you know, when it's their homecoming as well, because it's really important. Homecoming is all about the people that were uh, the past, the present, and the future, but really about the people who played here before us and uh, putting a great product on the field for them uh, so they can uh, stand tall and, uh, and, and represent the Gophers of the past generations before us in a positive manner. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. you got it. Roll the boat, Sky Mago Gophers. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.